Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February 2023 Symbiota Support Group meeting. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to see some new faces and uh, excited to talk about a topic that comes up a lot with Symbiota portals because there's such varied um, varied resources. So we have a lot of different people who are contributing data and who are using the data. And so we get a lot of similar uh, questions regarding snapshots. But before we get into the topic of the day, uh, we are going to have some announcements. Thanks for getting it started, Katie. So the first announcement that if you were here last month, you might remember, but we want to mention it again. If you're going to a conference this year, um, we'd like you to consider to take the opportunity to spread the word about your favorite Symbiota portal or portals. Um, last month, we did have someone take us up on this. So now we have a poster for CERNAC that's going to a meeting at the end of March. So, um, you know, if we don't have a poster made yet, we can make one for you. So don't hesitate to reach out. Just send an email to the help desk. This is kind of what they look like. But, you know, what we'll do is we'll draft up something and then give you the file so that you can like tailor it to, you know, whatever you want it to look like. And we can also help with the abstract if you need any um, input on that. And then we'd also like to point out that with the new year, we're starting to schedule some of our next portal campaigns for 2023. We have two coming up. So um, the Mid-Atlantic Herbaria campaign will be in March, followed by Midwest Herbaria in April. But if you think you know your portal would benefit from a campaign, please do not hesitate to reach out or help at symbiota.org. And if you're not sure you know what the campaigns are all about, um, we suggest maybe reviewing some of our past campaign materials, which are posted on our website at the link on this slide, which I can also put in the chat in a few minutes. And then we'd also like to make some announcements that some recent bugs and fixes have happened. Um, Katie, do you have anything specific you wanted to say about these? Yeah, uh, you might have experienced some problems with the batch determinations tool or the batch annotations tool. Um, and those were the, it appeared to function, but was not actually applying those annotations. So that's been fixed in a couple of portals, but um, the broader swath fixing is happening soon. So if you're like, man, this is really um, preventing me from going forward with my workflow, please reach out and we can prioritize your portal to get this fixed sooner rather than later. All right, I think this might be our last announcement. So Symbiota Communications, obviously you probably got the email saying that this is happening today, but if you know anybody else who might be interested in receiving our event announcements, for example, they can subscribe. Um, I'll put this link in the chat in a little bit. Generally, if you're an admin on a collection um, in Symbiota or an editor, you're like kind of auto subscribed, but sometimes there are people who aren't subscribed for whatever reason, um, and you can always just let us know by filling out this form. And then kind of on that note, occasionally people have a hard time receiving our emails. So if you think you should be receiving communications from the support hub, like specifically like newsletter type things or event announcements, and you're not, we strongly recommend um, adding hub at symbiota.org to your contacts. Even if um, you are receiving them that way, they won't eventually get like blocked by a spam filter. We do send out some kind of important administrative things from time to time. So we just want to make sure everybody's getting those. Um, so adding hub specifically, not help, but hub at symbiota.org to your contacts is kind of important for receiving those. And do we have anything else that anybody else would like to announce? I forgot to put these on the slides, but there will be a symposium at the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections meeting, which is in late May to early June. So if you're planning on going to that meeting, then you can uh, go find me and a bunch of other people who are going to be giving talks at that symposium, including James, who is in the audience, and maybe someone else, but I can't see all the participants. Any other announcements? And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end too. So if you have any random questions, we can take those later. All right, so let's go ahead and get into today's topic. We are talking about managing and updating snapshot data sets because, or I might want to call them snapshot collections because you can, there's kind of a difference between data sets and collections. Um, we're talking about what they are, um, how to update them. So what are snapshot collections? Where do they come from? 
how do you import and update snapshots? And we'll kind of hint at the next steps for snapshot management that's kind of um, brewing. I, I won't have anything necessarily to show you, but there are uh, improvements coming with the development of the API that's gonna make snapshots um, even quicker and more efficient to um, import. Okay, so what are snapshot collections? Well, there are multiple types of collections in Symbiota portals. And so when you're in the search page of a portal, and I'll just you know bring up a portal to show you. When you're in the search page of a portal, you'll see that it's filled with multiple different collections in here. And each of these collections may be a snapshot or they may be live managed. So a snapshot is when you manage the data in some other database somewhere. And that data eventually makes it into that Symbiota portal. So the main operating principle is that it's managed and edited somewhere else, and then only a copy of it goes into the Symbiota portal. A live managed collection doesn't have that separate management interface or database or anything. All they do is they enter and edit their data directly in the Symbiota portal because the Symbiota portals are actually collection management systems as well. So um, that's live managed. This is snapshot. External database to a portal, primarily portal is live managed. So, um, and this is just in words, the difference between the two. So you might be thinking, well, shoot, how do I know whether I'm a snapshot or at least I'm listed as a snapshot on my portal? Because there are times when people think that they're, they're live managing, but they are actually listed as a snapshot, which can cause some problems later on. So you'll want to check this at some point um, in your portal, various portal um, instances, if you're in one or many of them. And it'll look like this. So on your portal page, if you go to the collection profile, and let me show you how to get there. So if you were here in, um, in this example, the Lichen portal, and you would find your collection somewhere on this list, let's say it's with Emery, and you click more info, then you'll be able to see where it says management, it will either say, say uh, data snapshot, or if I go, for example, to the ASU collection, this is live data managed directly within data portal. So it's pretty clear once you find that piece, but I would recommend going to your collection and making sure that that matches your expectations. And there are some backend differences between um, live managed collections and snapshot collections. The main uh, difference between them kind of management wise is that if you live manage your data in a Symbiota portal, it can also generate um, globally unique identifiers associated with each of your specimens. But if you uh, have a snapshot data, data set and you manage your data somewhere else, Symbiota is not going to auto-generate global unique identi identifiers for you because the likelihood that you're going to have them coming in is pretty high. Um, and if you don't have global unique identifiers in your home database, you probably should be creating them in your home database. You don't want to have proliferation of global unique identifiers because then they're no longer helpful. OK, so practically in Symbiota, portals, where do the snapshots generally come from? They come from all sorts of places. Um, they can come from other collections management systems, such as Arctos and Specify and Emu and BGBase. Um, so other uh, really nice um, collection management systems that people are using. Um, snapshots may also come from other Symbiota portals. And you might think, well, why would you do that if you have it in two places? Um, well, the reason is, is because as many of you know, symbiota portals are often taxonomic or geographically based. And so you might end up sending a portion of your data to, um, for example, you have a big herbarium collection in the Cynet network, and you also manage your lichens in there, but then you send a copy of your lichens 
to the lichen portal specifically so that lichen researchers know to go look for, uh, to go into the lichen portal and look for all the data relevant to their research. Um, although one thing that we often suggest is live managing your data in the taxonomic portal um, that's most closely related to the data. So um, many collections will choose to manage their data live in or manage their vascular data live in one place and then their lichen data um, live in another place. And that's fine, they can coexist. Um, snapshots also come from other aggregators. So we import a great amount of data from collections that share their data through GBIF. Um, and then of course you can always have your locally managed spreadsheet or your um, our access database that's on that one herbarium computer that's also 15 years old. In that case, that's probably when you wanna consider uh, live managing in a symbiota portal because it's, um, it's safer, it's more distributed, it's copied. Um, and that's when you might wanna think about investing in a collection management system to be a little bit more robust. Okay, so the snapshots come from some other database, often a collection management system, and then those data are shared with a symbiota portal or multiple symbiota portals. And um, because the data come in different formats between those originating um, databases and in symbiota portals, there has to be some sort of connection, con uh, connector or connection point between that originating database and the symbiota portal. So what does that connector look like? Well, generally it comes in two forms. It's either a CSV file, which is just a spreadsheet, um, or a Darwin Core archive. And a Darwin Core archive is a little bit more um, robust. It has a little bit more structure. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But kind of the, the long and short of it is that if you can get your data into one of these two connector formats, a spreadsheet or a Darwin Core archive, then you can get it into a symbiota portal. And you don't even have to get it into one CSV file. If you have it in a bunch of um, different tables, you can export multiple CSV files and get it, in, get it into a symbiota portal however you need to. Okay, so if you are going to manage your data in, uh, for example, FileMaker or Access or Emu, you're probably going to be exporting a CSV file. Um, Emu also has a possibility to export a Darwin Core archive. Um, I know that this requires some setup by a database admin um, of Emu, so you would probably have to work pretty closely with your um, whoever your database administrator is there. Um, Specify has a separate tool to connect to Symbiota, at least in Specify 6. There have been some problems with that recently because um, Specify 7 is really the latest and greatest and is uh, quite a bit easier to work with in Specify 6. Um, so that may or may not be phased out. Um, or you can link to an existing Darwin Core archive. So these options over here, these are, uh, well, these first two require, you know, downloading this locally and then uploading it. Whereas you can just link to an existing Darwin Core archive. So you can, you can provide Symbiota with like, here's where you would go to download this link or this um, Darwin Core archive. And then the Symbiota portal is going to know to, download that to its server, analyze it, and then you're, you'll be able to look at it before it finally imports into the tables. Um, and some ways that you can have a link to an existing Darwin Core archive is um, with Specify 7, they have a new way that they can create um, a link, something along the lines of an RSS feed. Um, with a Symbiota portal, Symbiota portals have Darwin Core archives that you can link from. And then probably the most common that we work with is links that are provided by integrated publishing toolkits. And these, are, this is a piece of software that's provided by GBIF that um, allows your data to be packaged into a Darwin Core archive. And that provides a link that then a symbiotic portal can grab. 
Okay, so I'm going to go into a little more detail about what this actually looks like, because um, it can be a little bit conceptual until you actually see what how this works. So if you don't already have a collection in the Symbiota portal, then your first step for importing a snapshot is to have a collection set up. So that would be you go to whatever portal you're interested in having your data in, and then uh, you have the portal administrator or the Symbiota Support Hub create a collection for you. And then you just import your data. And often, uh, depending on where your data is coming from, you might want to get help from the Symbiota Support Hub or the portal administrator. Um, but this, at least, this webinar is intended to hopefully um, get you started. You can start working on it. Or if you already have a snap snapshot, hopefully this webinar is going to help you uh, know how to update your snapshot and go through those steps. So I would recommend um, what you can do is set up a saved import profile. So that is a thing that you're just going to refer back to every time you want to update your um, data in the future. And then all you got to do is do a couple clicks to run that saved import profile in the future. OK, so what does this look like? And let me go to an example in a portal here. OK. So let's say that I want to update this University of Museum Bergen collection. Um, this is a collection that we uh, harvest because they share their data via GBIF. So if I was the administrator for the University of uh, Museum of Bergen, then when I log into my profile and then go to occurrence management, I would see collection management um, or I would see that collection in the collection management section. Um, but I'm not an explicit editor, I'm just a super administrator. So I'm going to go there a different way. Okay. So if you had that one uh, collection in your administration control panel and then you, you clicked on it, you would come to this page here. And in your administration control panel now, you'll see the fourth option here is import update specimen records. And this is where you would normally go if you live managed or if you were snapshot and you wanted to bring in um, chunks of data. We already talked about some of these functions in uh, our, I think our second Symbiota support group meeting and we'll link to um, a recording on that in the future. But um, this is where you can, if you click on this, you have multiple options for how you can import data. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see this. Okay, so skeletal file up, up imports, those are generally um, for various management options, but what we're mostly going to be looking at right now are full text file imports, Darwin Core archive imports, and IPT imports. So, but like I said uh, previously, we're going to want to create a saved import profile if this is going to be something that we're going to be doing multiple times in the future. So it's usually good to import your data once and then update it regularly. So if you create a saved import profile, that's gonna make it very easy in the future. So back to this page, then I'm gonna go down to create a new import profile. And then it's gonna ask me what type I want to do. And I have some hints here. So if you just exported a CSV file and that's all you have is one or two CSV files, then you want to do a full text import. So that's down here called file upload. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but it's also accessed through full text file import. But if I was creating a new import profile, file upload, you could call it something and then you could create the profile and then you would refer back to it in the future. If you are exporting a Darwin Core archive that you then store locally on your computer and you want to upload, then you would want to select the Darwin Core archive manual upload option. 
But for the most part, people are going to be doing this link to an existing Darwin Core archive, or at least we hope that a lot of people are using this option because it's very, very simple. And that's when you would use this IPT resource or Darwin Core archive provider. So then you're gonna name it something. And then where it says path here, you're going to provide a link to where that Darwin Core archive can be found. So let's walk through an example here. Um, this one already has a saved import profile that I'm going to go look at. I go into import, saved import profiles. Then this is the saved import profile here. And if I clicked on this view or edit parameters, it will show me what has been placed here before. Okay, so this was the title and this was the path. And this is a path to an IPT or an integrated publishing toolkit. This is again, a resource that um, is provided by, the, uh, by GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And people will um, download and they will host an IPT instance is what it's called on their own um, servers. And the, that way they can format their data into a Darwin Core archive and then share it somewhere else. So if you're already doing that, then this might look familiar, familiar to you. If you're not, don't worry about it too much. Um, you can always contact the hub or anyone else uh, who is helping you manage your data locally, and they can figure out how you're going to share either a CSV or a Darwin Core archive of your data. Okay. Um, so oh, I did want to walk through a couple of um, notes before I go into that upload. Um, regarding importing a CSV file, um, we, again, we covered this in uh, a previous Symbiota support group meeting, and that involves you um, mapping each of your fields to a field in the Symbiota portal. And we have some um, pretty good documentation on this, and then the recording of this webinar is available too. So if Lin Lindsay will put this in the chat so that people can um, look at how you would do a file upload or skeletal file upload. Um, that's how you would import just a raw CSV file. If you're importing a Darwin Core archive, um, then your Darwin Core archive can have your specimen data, your annotation data, and your image data. And they're all connected to one another by this ID field. And that ID field is um, ideally your global unique identifier or some other identifier that links all this, um, the records together. Um, and I won't talk about that in the, quite yet, um, but the integrated publishing toolkit, which I'm gonna show you an example of right now, that's an open source web application created by GBIF to share biodiversity data. Um, for example, Vertnet hosts an IPT um, that helps people who use the Arctos collection management system get all their data to GBIF. So map it to the Darwin core and then get it up to GBIF. So that's um, really helpful. And like GBIF, Symbiota portals can harvest data that has been packaged as a Darwin Core archive and provided as a link. So back to this example here. Um, when you look at one of these pages, you can see when the data was uh, last updated. And this one was last updated on the 3rd of February. And I can look back at my collection here and see that this was last updated on the 1st of February. <clears throat> so this would be a good chance for me to update my snapshot and make it um, the most up-to-date possible. So this is the path to the Darwin Core archive. Um, technically, the path to the Darwin Core archive looks like this. It has the word archive instead of resource. But um, 
Symbiota portals can handle either. If it says resource, it will change it to archive. Um, and that's that'll be fine. Because normally when you go down to um, data as Darwin Core Archive file and then click download, you can barely see it, but in the bottom left of my screen, there is a link and it contains the link to the actual file that you would download. But the great thing is, is that the Symbiota portal can download it for you. You don't have to download it to your computer and then upload it to Symbiota. Okay, so if I click save profile here, and then I just select that saved import profile and click initialize upload. Because it's coming from an IPT, which uh, has, again, those three files, the specimen data, the identification data, and the images, it will show me three um, checkboxes here. And it will tell me which of the files exist here. Apparently, there's no identification history in this field or a file, but there is an occurrence file, which is the specimens, and there is an images file. And if you wanted to look at that map the mapping corresponding to each of those individual files then you could click this view details button and then it will show you a big scary table that's actually not that difficult to work with it's very long because there are lots of fields um, in the darwin core which is the biodiversity standards that we generally work with um, but it's pretty easy to deal with. So just on the left is the source field. So that's the, the fields from the incoming data. And then on the right is the target field. And so that's the field in the Symbiota database that you're going to put the data from that Darwin core or from that um, source field. So most of the time you won't need to fiddle with this if you're importing a Darwin Core archive, because if you're importing a Darwin Core archive, you have already aligned your data with the Darwin Core biodiversity standards. And um, hopefully those are going to just align fine because Symbiota is largely Darwin Core based. But it doesn't hurt to just kind of take a look and see what things might um, not be um, updated or might not be mapped according to your ex expectations. This looks fine. Um, you could try to look, oh, do we have an event remarks field? You can look through, oh, apparently we don't. So maybe that's just a Darwin core field that this symbiota portal doesn't support. And if you're happy with that, then you can just save your mapping and you can click start upload. So there are um, kind of three steps to the um, uploading process. The first is deciding what type of upload you're doing and then actually putting the file in. The second is uploading the data to a temporary table. And then the third is taking the data from that temporary table and sticking it into the actual database fields. I think I have a little graphic for this, yeah. So you take your data from your database, you translate them into a connector, which that connector again is a CSV file or Darwin Core Archive. And then as you upload into the Symbiota portal, it's gonna go into a temporary table in the database, and then it's going to be fully uploaded into the Symbiota portal um, main database. Okay, I see a couple of questions in the chat, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, answer those. <clears throat> okay, so Allison asked, if we do a project for our, let's say, Africa specimens only, should we manage them in our regional portal? Or should we join an Africa specific portal to manage them there? Um, it really depends on um, what type of uh, functions you're going to need in the portal. So Lindsay made the point that there might be a better curated African um, taxonomic thesaurus in the, um, in the Africa portal. However, if you have the data in both places, it can get really messy because some people might ed edit it in one portal and also in another portal. And there's currently no way of efficiently 
um, commingling those edits and just, you know, deciding which edits to keep. So I would err on the side of manage them in where you currently manage all your other data, unless you're doing a specific um, geo-referencing project or something that requires that the data be in that Africa portal. Um, most of the time you have, you have one portal where you manage most of your data, and then you just send subsets to other um, collections. So in this case, I think I would recommend keeping it in CCH2, Allison. Um, and then Diana asks, Symbiota can harvest data from Arctos. Can a Darwin core file from Symbiota be harvested to Arctos? The Arkansas State University collections are supposed to be in Arctos. And so far we've been managing the star herbarium as a live managed collection in CERNIC. Um, I don't know very much about Arctos's import um, functions. I assume that if they can, I assume they can import a Darwin core archive. Um, I don't know if they'd be able to import all of the annotations and the edits that you have made, but um, I would just reach out to them and make sure that they actually are live managing in Arctos. Okay, so we have uh, done this step right here from the connector to the temporary table. And that's what's going on right here is it gives us a pending data transfer report. So it has brought in the Darwin Core archive and it says, okay, so I think that I have found all the data. You are going to update all these records. And I didn't find any new records because maybe the only changes that have happened have been two existing records. And then there are four records that are in the Symbiota port a uh, portal, but not in the incoming Darwin Core archive. So this is a really important note, everyone lean in. When you bring in a Darwin Core archive and you want it to completely replace all of the data that you previously had in that portal, and you're just like, okay, remove all that data, here's my new package. It will not delete specimens from the Symbiota portal that are not in your Darwin Core archive. So when you import a Darwin Core archive, it only updates and adds, it does not delete the data that may have been deleted from your home database or that you have redacted from your home database. So this is really important when you're looking at this um, record, uh, this pending data transfer report, this will tell you how many of these records are, have not been deleted, but maybe need to be deleted. And if they do need to be deleted, you can go and delete them either manually or you can download this spreadsheet here and send it to the Symbiota Support Hub and say, hey, can you delete all these records? We deleted them from our database or merge them or whatever is the case. So you can look at them by clicking this little table here. And you could be like, oh, yeah, I remember those ones we deaccessioned or maybe you don't know. Or maybe you're like, oh, actually, we still have those. I wonder why they didn't link. And that's when you can um, start investigating what might have gone wrong. But then, uh, so this little icon on the left says preview first 1000 records and the one on the right says download records. And it's generally a good idea to, um, to do a download of that and just look through it to make sure it matches your expectations, um, the, the records to be updated and maybe even the new records. But I'm just gonna click this this table right here. And then there are a couple of things that um, this table is going to tell us about how successful our update might be. Um, one of the most obvious things that you might run into trouble with is, um, now I'm gonna open this over here, is if you find that all of your records are, or none of your records are updated and instead you have 95,000 new records. So in that case, your unique identifiers did not link up to one another. And what you might be doing is accidentally trying to bring in duplicate data, um, but they haven't lined up on their unique identifiers. And um, that's because there's an, the ID field in your Darwin Core archive is going to map to a field called the DBPK in Symbiota. 
And you have to make sure that this ID field in your Darwin Core Archive is the same between subsequent uploads, because if it is not, then uh, Symbiote is not going to recognize those as updates to data. They're going to say, eh, it's a brand new specimen. Um, and Herrick, I will get to your question um, kind of a little bit later when I talk about um, the filters. Great question, though. Another thing you'll want to make sure to look at in your um, temporary table is whether your scientific names look um, correct, properly formatted. If I click this table icon here, you should make sure that there's a scientific name field that has just the scientific name, and then separately is the scientific name authorship. If you see the scientific name with the authorship all in this field here, that's a red flag. That means that it hasn't parsed out your scientific name and scientific name authorship correctly. So for an example of uh, one that has been done incorrectly, let me do another example here. I am going to go to this saved import profile. This is a pretty small collection that we also get from an IPT via GBIF. And then if I click on this, I'll say, oh, the scientific name is all stuck into one field. Um, and it looks like maybe scientific name authorship was in a separate field um, that was coming in with the data, but we generally don't wanna see scientific names in this scientific name, um, or sorry, we don't wanna see authorships in this scientific name field. So, and the reason for that is that there are two different fields into which you can um, import scientific name. There's a full text scientific name option, which is where you would import the data if your scientific names do have authorships in them, like they're supposed to be there, then you want to map them to this scientific name field. If your scientific name fields do not have authorships embedded in them, then you will want to import them into this sci name field. So you can think of it as, you know, long names, including authorships, go in the longer named field, whereas shortened ones without any authorship, those go in the shortened sci name field. Um, and this will help Symbiota index all of your scientific names to the taxonomic thesaurus and make them searchable and linked to the actual um, taxa that are um, taxon descriptions and such. So in this case, I would say, oh, shoot, that's wrong. I'm going to exit out, go back to my collection management panel. I'm just giving up on this upload. And then I'm going back to my saved import profile, starting it up. And then I'm going to view details. And I'm gonna find my scientific name field and I'm gonna map it to scientific name because that's the one that, uh, where you put the authorships as well. Okay, save mapping, start upload. And then there we go. Our scientific name has been parsed out. I see the genus specific epithet, scientific name authorship. And if you're not sure whether the scientific name is correct from this table, you're like, wait, but there's one that has the authorship and there's one that doesn't have the authorship. You could just um, import the data and then do a search based on a genus. And if you can't find your specimens based on that genus, that means, oops, your, scientific, your uh, scientific names didn't map to the taxonomic thesaurus. The taxonomic thesaurus and indexing is a little bit complicated. So we're covering a lot of very complicated ideas at the same time in this webinar. So there's another recording that talks specifically about the taxonomic thesaurus that Lindsay will link in the chat. Okay, so 
it is commonly important that you are importing just a subset of your data into your snapshot. So for example, if you're just trying to bring in your bryophytes, but you have one Darwin core of all of your specimens, how do you just bring in the bryophytes? Or maybe you're trying to import your data into the Africa herbaria portal, so you only want your African specimens. Um, that's a good time to use this really neat tool called the Custom Occurrence Record Import Filters. Kind of a mouthful, but um, I'll show you an example. Let's see, I'll show you an example in the Consortium of California Herbaria database. Um, so in the Consortium of California Herbaria database, we bring in data from the Harvard University Herbaria. Um, but the Harvard University Herbaria have lots and lots of specimens across the entire globe. Um, and we don't necessarily need those all for the, this California centric portal. And so what this portal has decided is that, that they bring in the California, Oregon, and Mexico specimens. So what we do is in our saved import profile, which is a link to the IPT that the Harvard University or Barrier have provided. This might take a while because it'll be a relatively large IPT instance. I might be able to show it to you in the, oh, it's already done. Okay, so when you're on this page here, if you go to the occurrence records and then click view details, scroll all the way to the bottom and there are these custom occurrence record import filters. And you can apply up to three filters um, based on the incoming fields. So in this case, we've said, okay, bring in anything that has the state province of um, or equals California, Oregon, and Baja, California. If you want multiple values, you can separate them with a semicolon in this case. But you could also um, do things based on like the kingdom. So if there was a kingdom field in this incoming um, Darwin Core archive, which I don't think there is here, but um, that's because this is a vascular plants IPT. But if you had um, some higher taxonomy that you could base it off of, like phylum or order or even families, you can put a big list of families in there separated by semicolons. And that way it's only going to bring in um, those families. So like we could just say, bring me anything from California. Um, also bring me anything where the family is Asteraceae. And so then if I did that upload, it'll probably be a lot smaller. Um, and this again is gonna take a while, but it would show you in result, it would pull out all the things that are only from California and that are only in Asteraceae in this example. That can be a little bit more tough when you're dealing with um, taxonomically diverse groups like lichens and uh, bryophytes are not too bad because they have, um, I think, phyla. Um, but then pteridophytes, you might have to just get a big, long, concatenated list of all the families of pteridophytes that you're importing and apply that to your filters. So that might take a little bit, what, a little bit, but I can show you the result in a moment. Oh, and those filters you can actually save into your saved import profiles. So you don't have to reapply them every time. You just set that up and then you click the save mapping and then you can um, import with those filters every single time. Um, and it is important to note that some Darwin cord fields are not currently supported by the Symbiota um, data schema. And so they, those might not be imported. And here's my example here of the Harvard. Oh, those are still loading the images in, um, but I'll show you those when it's done. Okay. so. In the case when you can't use a um, occurrence record import filter, 
to filter out your data. Maybe there's something more specific you need to search on, like maybe there is a value within a field that you need to search for. Um, you could probably still do a contained search. But for whatever case, there are there's a way of being able to um, change or edit or transform your data before loading it into the final table. And that is by using a stored procedure. And a stored procedure um, is just a, an SQL, some SQL queries. So basically some um, SQL ways of transforming your data um, that are going to maybe move some stuff around, concatenate some stuff, replace some uh, fields or, or um, values within fields and then apply those changes before they go into the final tables. So when you have your originating data set, um, you turn it into a connector, so a, a Darwin Core Archive or a CSV, the import filters will apply before you bring them into the temporary table. And then if you have a stored procedure, it's going to apply your stored procedures between the steps of temporary table to final table. So there's like two levels of filtering that you can apply to bringing in snapshot data. Okay, here's my example here. So it said, hey, I found 7,073 California asteraceae for you. And it didn't match 100,000 specimens because those are all the remaining Oregon and Baja California and non-asteraceae. So that's, I'm not gonna do that, but there's the, that Harvard example. So a stored procedure, and this is getting um, really into the, the minutia and details, but it's important to know that you are able to make these changes if, you're, if you need to change anything about your Darwin Core Archive and you don't have to go open up the Darwin Core Archive and do a bunch of Excel functions. You can do this in SQL. So a stored procedure is a set of SQL statements that apply transformations to your data before you import them into your final table. And so some examples include concatenating fields. So you may have um, data in, uh, in multiple fields in your database that you want to concatenate into the final fields that are available in the Symbiota portal. You may want to standardize fields or values. Um, you may want to remove null characters. Sometimes your database will actually stick the word null or 9999 into your empty fields. And so if you need to batch remove all those, um, you can do that using a stored procedure. And if you have really, really specific filters, that's also um, a thing you can do with SQL um, stored procedures. So for example, um, lichens are very complicated taxonomically um, because they are in all sorts of different uh, families and sometimes the whole genus is a lichen or lichenicolous or um, like, I don't know the other word, um, but lichen-like. Um, you can have entire families that are lichens or just a genus or just a species within that genus. And so we had to write a whole bunch of SQL statements that would pull out all the taxa that were um, lichen and lichen related. So that was a very specific example. Um, but if you have anything like that, that you need to apply to your data, for example, oh, I need to only pull out the specimens that are in this one particular uh, project or that were in this one particular locality, then you can try using the import filters. And if those don't work, you can use a stored procedure. Okay, so some common problems that I already referred to is that your ID field might change between when you have created your snapshot the first time and the next time you're trying to update your snapshot. Um, and like I said, you'll see that maybe you'll have 95 records that aren't matched and 95 records that are coming in new. And you're like, hmm, suspicious. I think that uh, maybe they're just not matching up correctly. And that's when you'll wanna open up those tables and compare and see whether those 95 records really truly are new. 
Um, another common problem is that maybe you added fields or removed or changed fields between the times when you were updating your snapshot. Um, and in that case, you just need to open up that, um, that mapping and kind of reassess. So that's when you would go in to your saved import profile, you initialize the upload, and then you take a look at the mapping and see, okay, what did I add? You know, what are my new yellow highlighted fields that might maybe aren't mapped to the right place now? Because people will change their um, their IPTs or their Darwin Core archives. Um, like I mentioned before, sometimes scientific name is mapped to the wrong field, um, and sometimes you might have leaky or ineffective filtering. So maybe you're trying to filter out all the Asteraceae, but you have like a bunch of grasses that just don't have a family name, or maybe they have the wrong family name, or maybe you're over filtering, you're under filtering. So there's often a lot of fiddling you have to do with the filters there. Um, another thing that happens sometimes is that your Darwin Core archive is too big for the server. So if you have 20 million records in an IPT, you're probably not going to be able to have the server download that Darwin Core archive and then filter through it. So if you have a huge IPT that you're trying to um, filter through, then um, I would recommend breaking that your IPT up into different Darwin Core archives um, or you just reach out to us and that it's pretty rare that you'll have that many specimens, but it does happen. Okay, then just a couple more things before I open up open us up for questions is that after you update your um, snapshot, there are a couple of things that we recommend that you do just to make sure that your data are um, working with the portal as efficiently and most usefully as possible. One of them is to run the taxonomic cleaning tool, and uh, we'll post some more information about the taxonomic cleaning tool in the chat. Um, but this is a tool that if it's linked up to a taxonomic resource, then you'll be able to auto import any names into the taxonomic thesaurus that you might have imported as new names from your specimen data. So this often happens, you know, when someone publishes a new name, and so you get these 10 new specimens, and then you go look for them and you're like, shoot, I can't find these, where are they? It's because that name wasn't added to the taxonomic thesaurus. So when you were searching based on a genus, for example, they didn't show up. So run that taxonomic cleaning tool. Um, also run the thumbnail building tool. That's if only if you have images. But in your um, administration control panel, there is at the almost the very bottom, it says thumbnail maintenance. And in this case, nothing has to be done. But if you had some images that didn't have thumbnails associated with them, then when you do a specimen search later on, then these uh, thumbnails wouldn't show up. And so people wouldn't even really know that you have images associated with them because there's no image um, in the search results. So make sure to check out that thumbnail building tool. And then last but not least, and I promise this is easy, just update your statistics. So let's say I just updated, um, go to the Bergius Museum. Then in your administration control panel, you go down to the very bottom, click update statistics, and it's just gonna update all these values that are here in the bottom for you. Okay, so hopefully that gave you at least an understanding of um, where snapshots come from. And probably the most useful pieces um, really depend on uh, where you have your data and what snapshots you're um, managing. But um, just know that you'll just have some way of connecting your Symbiota portal to um, another database. And an important point for um, users of Symbiota portals is that this, this whole process, because it has so many little things that could go wrong, um, and because you know IPTs aren't necessarily updated on a, a regular schedule, 
Snapshots are not updated automatically. So if you see that your snapshot has been updated on the first of the month, that's because the Symbiota Support Hub has done that for you because your data is in an IPT or something. Um, but that's not necessarily the case for all snapshots. And um, so someone has to go in and do that. So if you have your data in a snapshot uh, or in another collection management system and it's a snapshot and you're like, hey, why aren't these new specimens in here? It's because your snapshot hasn't been updated and um, you can go and do that if you have administrative control of your um, collection in the Symbiota portal, which you should. So feel free to reach out, reach out and get access to that so that you can update your snapshot whenever you want. Okay, Diego, oh, great question. I did not show where a stored procedure is um, actually um, applied. I'll show you where it's applied, um, but a stored procedure must be written and then uh, put into the actual server side of the database. So you can't necessarily instigate one. You'll need help from your portal administrator or the Symbiota Support Hub, depending on who has backend access. Um, but here, I just bring in, actually, I think it's right here. Yeah, so in your um, upload parameters, you had an option for title and path, and then it will give you an option for stored procedure. And so you just put the name of the stored procedure here. And in this case, the stored procedure is asking for an input variable. And so that's the input variable that uh, we have entered which happens to be the collection ID number. So that's where you would apply it. Um, you would need to uh, coordinate with your database administrator about um, setting up that stored procedure. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could just email it to the Symbiota Support Hub and then we'll, we'll probably just do some checks and say like, hey, do you mean for this to go here and there? And uh, that's how it goes. All right, I know it's a lot of content and um, quite a lot of, of backend thinking, but any questions about updating snapshots, they can be general or specific. Okay, well, I'm gonna stop the recording.